you're very welcome to the inaugural event of the Dirty Salad Club. Thank you all very much. You can, if you if you want, feel free to uh, share your videos so we all get to know each other. That's up to yourself. But what is the Dirty Salad Club about? Well, the Dirty Salad Club is here to help coaches excel in unpredictable times. Well, actually, to help each other. So we're at Kinchlines. We're very much. Uh, we help people to be practitioners to use psychometrics and to do coaching. And we're all in the same space. Now, my own background is I'm a business psychologist. I started as a counseling psychologist, but then moved into business, as I said, because uh, this space is a lot easier. But what we're doing today, really, like we work with people with behavioral insights and from psychometrics and team coaching. We train other people to become coaches in the IMI, etc. But today, it's all about us. It's about the practitioners. It's about us coming together and supporting each other. Okay, so the Dirty Salad Club, it's about us being vulnerable, sharing, taking care of each other and having a conversation together. We run them regularly every week. Now, what's interesting as well is that we're always asked to look after other people. But pressing pause and actually seeing how we can look after each other, it's going to be very helpful. Now, you might be wondering, where did the name the Dirty Salad Club come from? And this is their first club session. And you're all very welcome. Well, it came. Well, it, it came from the idea about being vulnerable together, but it actually came from a band I was in in university, which was called the Dirty Salad Club. So, just for a second, I'm going to embarrass myself and show you a picture, uh, which I was asked to do. That's us there in the sea. That one actually got into the newspaper, so we're very happy with that. Brilliant band went absolutely nowhere, but we had lots of fun. But what we're going to do today, which is more important. What are we going to talk about today? Well, today we're going to get together. We're going to do a dash of humor. A humor is one of the key components in terms of positive psychology. And positive psychology is what we use in Kinch Lines. Positive psychology, by the way, is not just happy thoughts or think positively. Because you know yourself, if you're not feeling great and somebody says to you, just think positively, that's quite irritating. Positive psychology is a rigorous science behind what is people functioning at their optimal level. And there's many ways that we as coaches can bring positive psychology into the coaching room and our own lives. Humor being one of the key components of it. And it really helps us be resilient in the face of uh, adversity, which is a pandemic. We're then going to look at a splash of coaching, which is what we all do. And you might, you might say I'm a HR, I'm L and D, but we're all using coaching conversations to try and make a difference. We're using coaching conversations as a direct route to allow people to use positive psychology. Now, coaching, I mean, I teach in the IMI. Everybody, even 10 years ago up there, wanted to become executive coaches. The course is full, but people on the course don't necessarily want to be exec coaches. They're all leaders, people in HR dealing with change who want to know how to have coaching conversations. And if you want to bring emotional intelligence or positive psychology into your life and others, coaching is a direct route to doing that. So we'll look at a splash of coaching in a second. And we're also going to look at a sprinkle of successful EI emotional intelligence moments. So there's lots of feedback coming for us, lots of issues at the moment, and you know they can become overwhelming. But actually, there's also a sprinkle of successful moments, and we can amplify them and we can look at them. Different moments that wouldn't have been happening if we weren't in this pandemic. Now, you'll notice humor, positive psychology, and you use a solution-focused approach, solution-focused therapy, and a sprinkle of successful EI moments. What, we all, what they all have in common today is they are all positive psychology. Emotional intelligence is one of the key components of positive psychology. Coaching is a direct route to bring it into people's lives. And humour, which is growing, and I think the Irish especially can add. We haven't added a lot to psychology, the Irish. But I think humour may be a bit where they come into their own. So let's have a quick look at this and a dash of humour. And humour is very important for many, many reasons. And I know a lot of us are looking at now in terms of the social distancing. Um, well, some people here are more into it than others. But, you know, the closest, this is an interesting one from the research, the closest distance between two people is actually you can create humour and laughter. And that's why you'll often see people having a bit of banter when they meet up first, but they're actually relaxing their amygdalas and they're connecting, releasing endorphins between people. And, you know, obviously empathic communication makes people feel connected with humour. And laughter is one of the closest distance between two people. And that is something that I'm actually seeing out there hugely so. And the other one is, if you take things too seriously, you might miss things. And that's really interesting. It's really helpful when we're trying to be resilient, especially in the current time that we're in. Because if you, you know, if you go back into that fixed mindset, control and command, taking things very seriously, not open to feedback, you're not going to be creative or collaborative or innovative in any way. 
because we're scared, we're anxious, we revert to type. What's interesting in our space, even when people are trying to become better leaders, more transformational, using emotional intelligence, when something like this happens, it can, they can revert to type and become very much kind of, you know, the con you know, controlling leader who not only does not bring out the best in themselves, but they deplenish the engagements of other people. Years ago, or, you know, when the boom was happening and we were in a boom before this, and we'll get back there, everybody's doing leadership courses, hundreds of people in the courses, turning up saying, I'm a great leader, are you a great leader? And we're all slapping each other on the back. But the reality is it's slightly, well, a lot easier to be a great leader when things are going well. Now, when there's a blip, this is the time when we re need real leadership. And now for many reasons, it's the least likely time people are going to actually go after the development. But we need to influence them that this is the most important time to be at that development. You know, now is when leadership, anybody can leave when things are going well. Now is when leadership is really needed. And not taking things too seriously can greatly help performance. Even before meeting, the uh, research would show that if you say something true and positive and have a bit of crack, essentially, before a team meeting begins, people are much more likely to be engaged, come with more energy, and uh, the performance levels is higher. So there's been so many uh, memes in the WhatsApp going around, and I was trying to think of what will I share today in the first inaugural event of the Dirty Salad Club? Well, if you know the, if you know Marcy's song, that was quite a good one. I'll go out tonight, but I haven't got a mask to wear. Now the next. Now, I, I'm very conscious, by the way, it's a bit like, you know, when you're sharing jokes, it's a bit like when, you, when you're, you're on the uh, aeroplane and you watch a movie and you think, that was great. And you share it with a friend or a colleague and they watch it and the feedback is, that was useless. And then you rewatch it and you agree yourself. So it's something about being on that aeroplane that made the movie seem a little bit more in-depth than it actually was because you're probably half sawed and half asleep. It's similar with the cabin fever that we're experiencing with these jokes. They seem quite funny at night when you're sitting down watching your Netflix, but then the next day they mightn't be so funny. So what I'm going to show you is one video, uh, uh, one Philly uh, video, uh, and thanks for the comment there, uh, Michael, know that it's funny, thank you. But it is, and when I talk about humor, we're talking about using it in an intentional way. So would you please bear with me and put up your sound if you can before I ask you more. At first I was afraid, I was petrified Kept thinking how I'd ever live without the world outside But then I spent so many nights scuffing Chris and neck and wine I know it's time to say we're gonna be just fine And so we're here, stuck in this room I don't know when we're getting out There's no better place to face the doom I should have bought that bag of rides I should have stopped pop my bar roll If I had known for just one second I'd have such a messy hole But I've got that Plenty of gin That homeschool schedule Can't go straight in the fucking bin I wanna smash my husband's face I wanna wave my kids goodbye But I won't crumble I won't lay down and die Okay, I'm sure a few of you have already seen that. So guys, what we're doing here, the Dirty Salad Club, is about us coming together as a community, being a bit vulnerable, helping each other out as practitioners, having a bit of crack, etc. But that is, you know, there's a lot of uh, research behind humour. We, we, we write it off very quickly. Emotional intelligence was written off very quickly. So it's building trust. But humour is the closest distance, and laughter, the closest distance between people. So if you can bring in humour that suits the environment you're in, it can make a significant difference. It also, by the way, lightens up the amygdala. You take things less seriously, but you're more likely to perform better, which is interesting, which is building on the flow work of Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, who, again, is one of the key figures in positive psychology. Let's look at a splash of coaching. That's why we joined the Thursday Salad Club, to get a bit vulnerable, jump into it, and have a conversation with each other. Because, you know, I teach in MBAs and in coaching. You never hear the person, if they've enjoyed the course, say it was because of the speaker or the lecturer or was because of the notes, or was because of the deck. Now, that said, we're going to give you everything back that we cover every week. 
I'm going to give you your teams and patterns back. You'd be writing stuff up and, you know, in the breakout rooms, but just like the old fashioned way, do you remember the flip charts? We take them down, we write them up. Well, we're going to write up all your comments and your ideas and send it back to you so we can create a community where we're sharing and learning in the best of positive psychology. But you'll always hear at the end of the MBA course, that was great. Why? Because of the conversations and the people we were involved in. So I want to share with you one from the solution focus world from a guy, a guy called Luke Isabert, who calls himself a solution focused cognitive and systemic therapist. He's fantastic. Now, he, I am uh, uh, trained in solution focused therapy. We use it as a vehicle to bring positive psychology into, into the coaching room. He works mainly with addictions and uh, people who had uh, chronic drug habits, etc. He had three beautiful daily questions that he got them to ask, had some great, uh, gr great results from it. But what's interesting, those questions are probably more useful when going through a pandemic that we're going through now, to get people who are catastrophizing and worried, just to focus that you don't have to worry about worrying, because that will come at you. The amygdala is there looking after that, but you do have to worry about staying focused on what's working. And these questions are very helpful to ask your clients and yourself. So the first question Luke came up with was, it's kind of similar. Do you remember Martin Seligman, the father of positive psychology? He had the appreciation journal we'd say each evening jot down something that's going well. Because it's not that nothing's going well, it's just we don't notice it. We only focus on what we think about. And if we're thinking about the coronavirus and the virus and what's not working, well, we'll see lots of that. We also need to not ignore the bits that are working because we need to amplify those bits. So the three daily questions Luke would uh, say, and you can turn this into your own language for your own coaching, but was, what have I done today that I am happy with? What has someone else done that I am happy with or grateful for? And how did I react so that that person might be encouraged to do it again? What do I see around me, hear, feel, smell, taste that I am happy with or grateful for? This is about getting people to notice what's going well. Those three questions, very useful for people who have, you know, suffering from anxiety and addictions, very useful in the current climate. So now, what we're here for, we're gonna go into breakout rooms. This is about having conversations with each other. Now, how this is going to work, I'm going to put up the, uh, the question here. You're going to go into a room probably with about two or three other people, your fellow practitioners and coaches, and you're going to maybe come up with or share what you believe is the most useful coaching question or activity that you have used recently. I've given you a few coaching questions there that I was using from Luke. I'll also share with you an activity afterwards, and I want us to share and learn from each other well, what question, or even if you haven't used it, what question have you been thinking about lately that you're thinking, I'm going to bring that into a coaching session with me? And then we're going to, we'll come back and we'll do a bit of feedback on that. So I'm going to break you now into these rooms. You're going to have three of you in it. How it works, by the way, is you'll have about four minutes in each room. It will then bring you back. It will give you a countdown and it will bring you back automatically. So let me just see. I have you all there. I'm going to open all rooms. Okay, so you should now be all ready to join your rooms. Please have fun, introduce yourselves, and I'll see you back in four minutes. Welcome back, everyone. Would anybody like to share it in the, you can share it in the chat room, or you can tell me now, put your hand up. Who would like to share a piece of positive gossip? Who picked up a question that you just listened to, and you went, Jesus, that's brilliant. I'm going to use that. Who picked up a cracker that you'd like to share? Would anybody like to share, please? Feel free to unmute yourself and have a chat. Who would like to share a piece of, a piece of uh, gossip, but a positive gossip? Something that they've taken away from the session they've just been in, a question you may use. Hi. Hi, Gary. Hi, nice to see you. Um, you Gary. Julie um, shared in our group, uh, working with engineers who were, might be struggling with risk-taking or decision-making, a great question was, what are some of the small steps that you can take towards that, rather than trying to do the big thing? Yeah, love it. And it's all about the small steps. People often, it's when they panic and the change happens, they do big dramatic, over, you know, catastrophize everything. But actually, the smaller steps are the better. And I'll give you a little tip on small steps, guys, because it's all about making progress on small steps. But a definition of a small step, according to Theresa Engelbel, you know, the professor in Harvard who talks about the progress principle, it must be positively worded, so something you want, within your control and not reliant 
and somebody else changing or doing something first. And that's very interesting because, and the last one's even better because if you're, if you're sitting in a coaching session and you're asking for tasks or small steps, if your client is telling you something that's not in their control, having a little chat with them, or if it's not positively worded, they're actually saying what they don't want rather than what they do want, or lastly, that it's actually a goal for somebody else. In fact, that they have to sit back and not be able to do anything until somebody else does something first, unlikely they'll do it. Gary, thank you for sharing. Who else? Can we have one more? Who else would like to share? Uh, uh, yeah, good morning. Hi. Um, uh, hi, good morning. Um, I actually really liked the one Billy um, brought into the session at the very start. What opportunity is this crisis bringing for you? So I thought that's a real anchor point, isn't it, for getting people to reflect on what positive actions uh, can they make or bring as a result of how their world has completely changed yeah, yeah. Uh, all around them. Yeah, and I love the positive assumption in the question. Mm. There's got to be something, but if you're catastrophized, you're not noticing any of it. Yeah. So that's very, very powerful. We used to use the, uh, the Martin Seligman Institution Focus Therapy, the appreciation question. And what you say to us, and the first session with somebody, this is the clinical world, it was normally anxiety or depression. And you say to them, can you keep a journal? Every night, just jot down one thing that goes well in it. We'll have a chat about it next week. That's generally when they look at you a bit loosely and they go, look, nothing's going well. That's why I'm talking to you. Now, <laughs> you, don't, you, don't, you don't ask to see it the next week, but nine times out of 10, they come flying in with this journal. You know, now they're Irish mainly, so they'll always say, probably a lucky week now, in case you think I'm okay. But noticing, they, you know, they've got so used to noticing what they don't like about themselves. You know. They look in the mirror, they turn on the radio, they think of their friends. Everything is just a reinforcement of why they're useless. But little by little, if you start to focus on what you're good at, you can amplify that. So then looking at the opportunities in it, that's also going to help. Many thanks, Caroline. Do we have one more? Would anybody else like to share one? Not yet? Okay. Well, if you'd also like to type them in, you're very welcome. Any question that you liked, because we're going to transcribe and cut and paste and give you everything back. As I was saying, this is like a modern version of the flip chart sheets. This is all your work stuff you can find helpful. And even between now and when we meet again, if you join this, the club session next week, we can share maybe a question that you've given a go and that you might have found useful. Okay, let's keep going. We only have 45 minutes this morning. My main work uh, as a business psychologist is very much using psychometrics uh, as behavioural insights, and they're probably more useful now in the current climate than they've ever been. Because as I think was uh, this, uh, the title there, the potential of psychometrics in an anxiety uh, pandemic. This is the work of, uh, do you know Lucy Kellaway, I love her, she writes in the Financial Times, she goes, actually, it's a pandemic, all right, but actually mainly it's an anxiety pandemic. And then Peter Clark, who also writes in the Financial Times, was talking about, it's like Brexit, like families are divided. Some people in the family are saying, sure, it's only like a flu. The other people are saying, we're all gonna die, the life is gonna end. Now, what she recommends, if you are one of those catastrophers who think that everything is going to end, stop reading updates. And if you are one of those people who believe that everything's fine, start reading updates. So there's probably somewhere in the middle. Okay, but it's the small steps and it's about keeping things, especially for everybody at home, small steps and keeping everything as normal as possible. Big changes are not helpful. and Actually, they're not very uh, mentally and emotionally, they'll drain you. So what are some potential uses of behavioral insights gained from scientifically validated assessments? Well, we use them very much to highlight how people can be more resilient and adapt to change in a way suited to their personality. Now, this is important because most people try and adapt or get resilient. You know, they're told to be resilient, but we all adapt in a different way. It's a bit like looking at the change curve and we all have to be in a specific part of it. Well, we're all different and that's good, but pretending you're not different and pretending that you, you, know, you just have to get up and get on with it, well, we're all suited to adapting it in a different way. Here's the thing, most people might know what that is for them. So that's our value add. We can actually help them work out what works for you because what works for you might not work for me and vice versa. So that's where the psychometrics can really help in terms of this facing this adversity. The other one is actually to show the different roles or styles people in the group have when remote working. This is really interesting because, you know, there's going to be a lot of, obviously, uh, kind of, you've got the, the, the initial bounce of home working, but collaboration will break down if it's not done properly. People want the more, you know, passive aggressive behavior because we've left space time with each other, etc. And everybody has a different style and a way, a preferred way of working at home. 
And this hasn't been looked at before. I saw yesterday on LinkedIn, there was a plethora, it was great, of the MBTI and the discs and linking which to which, depending on you know, your remote working style, what you might enjoy. But it is a great, the psychometrics are a great way to view how people on your team are, you know, how they'll operate when working at home. Most conflict, remember, is a misunderstanding of somebody else's intent. But actually, the more we share this, the more we share our preferred home working ways, remote working ways, the less likely this would fall into that trap. Again, a useful scientific way to look at that is using the psychometrics. Now, here's the other one to help people learn about themselves and view themselves as a project. This is a perfect opportunity. It's a bit like when Caroline shared with us about Billy saying, what is the opportunity? Most people say, if I ever had the time, I would do self-reflection. When people are about to die, they wish they'd spend more time, you know, learning about themselves, staying still, being mindful, being present. But we're too busy. We keep going, we keep going, we keep going. There's a lovely Zen Buddhist story about a guy galloping on a horse, Tic Tac Yang, the the Vietnamese monk talks about this guy uh, galloping on a horse. He's very important looking and he's going very impressive and he's flying by. And a monk asks the rider, Jesus, where are you going? And he says, I don't know, ask the horse. Everybody keeps so busy because it makes us feel important, makes us feel productive. But a lot of us don't have a clue what that's about. And when we're about to die, we go, I should have actually done a bit more reflection. When people are told you only have X months to live, they go after a bucket list. You know, like, you, you know, and the, the, on the book of this, it's always the stuff that we're talking about, you know, meaningful, that you should bring into your life in some shape or form now. But people put it off. They put it off. They go, I'll do it one day. Once the kids are raised, once the pension is in, you know, once I have my money, it's always going to be around the corner that we get around to making ourselves a project. But you know what happens around that corner? You just die. And people ignore that. Nobody wants to talk about it. We are all nearly gone as it is. Let's enjoy it, let's reflect, let's be more mindful about it. And this is a perfect time to help our clients with this, to help people learn about themselves and view themselves as a project. And what's really interesting about this also, guys, is that it's also a great time to use these skills to bring people together who are working remotely so they can collaborate better. So when you're in with a client who might be going, guys, we're cutting non-essential training, I would be saying to them, this is the most essential training you could have to keep up engagement and collaboration. Our work has never been more important. So uh, don't, don't say no to the first thing, show them the value of it, because they don't understand that they're not as close to it as we are. And then to help people respond using their resources and strengths, people generally don't know what their strengths are, they know what their competences are, but they don't work out their resources, they don't highlight, they don't take time. Often they'd be very good, especially with managers and other people's, but doing your own one is uh, the most effective. And that's where we're going to be effective. Now, let's have a little competition with all the doom and gloom. Now, what we're going to ask you to do for this competition is go to our LinkedIn page, uh, the Kinshine's page, and it just says there, will you comment on our post by sharing an EI, which is Emotional Intelligence Success Story, and you can win a Hardness Resilience Gauge report and debrief of your results. I'm going to share with you shortly now a couple of other EI uh, success stories that I've pulled out, just to get us going, but this is a great one, actually. It's, uh, it's very topical at the moment, because Hardiness, there's a book just out, it's out actually in eight book. Um, by Paul Baritone, he's a military psychologist with Stephen Stein, the big, uh, the big wig psychologist. These guys literally, very top, have just released this book. It's going to be out in Europe in April, but it's very much hardiness are all the psychological components available to us to deal with change and uh, you know, available for helping us in, uh, enhance our own resilience. So think about that. How timely could it be when we're facing a global pandemic that we can look at the psychological components relied uh, on for developing resilience. We have a scientific way to measure it. This book also, I know we have Pedro Angulo is also online and he's actually endorsed it on the back. So we're thinking in how much someone reads this out. He's the head of leadership development in AIB. He said, this book is essential uh, reading for executives wanting to improve the resilience of their people and themselves. Hardiness is full of highly practical tips and techniques on how to do just that. So that's my, uh, that's my book in a month in the Dirty Salad Club you'll get to uh, hopefully have a crack at winning the, uh, the assessment. Now, here's an activity I'm gonna share with you, which is great. Be yourself more with skill. We are often thought about this. It's all about how can you be yourself. When people panic, they revert, let alone they're more like themselves, they're more like the kind of control command version of themselves. Now, the beautiful thing actually about working from home, and this was pointed out by Lucy Kellaway again in the Financial Times, it's kind of like a spotlight into people's soul. You're actually seeing them, not just in their job description, but you're seeing them outside of their job description, which will greatly help connection and engagement. In fact, when this pandemic is over, we can have more engaged employees and relationships within the workplace, i.e. more high performing, that's what the company cares about, because of this, if we do it correctly. And we have a great, 
opportunity to ask you to help out yourself more with skill. Now, uh, how do you do that? How do you show up authentically? Well, here we go. This is a coaching question. You can ask yourselves, guys, but also then turn it into your own language, bring it into your own coaching. So, so look and see the, the, how authentic is that? I have a streaming baby background. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll mute everyone. Okay, I'll, I'll try and mute everyone, should I say. Okay, I think, I think the baby's gone. Best of luck with that. Uh, so here we go. So there's a global pandemic happening. However, it is one, also one of those days when you're at your best, okay? So people often say, oh, you need to keep the chin up. You need to, you know, I'll go in, I'll do my best. Well, what actually is that? You know, what is your best? So, you know, people don't give behavioral descriptors to these things. They just say, oh, I need to be more resilient. But if actually we wrote down what resilience is, we'd all have different definitions. So in coaching, we are there to actually give them an insight into what that would look like if they were at their best, or if they were more resilient. And these questions help you do just that. It says, list five things you would notice about yourself when you start your day. And that's literally waking up, the smaller the better. What five things would you notice if you were at your best? So go into what you at your best look like when you wake up and get real detailed about this, what would you notice? Then it shares the next coaching question around that would be list three things each family member might notice about you in the morning. Also, how would other people see that you are at your best today? What do they see you doing? How do you react to them? What do you do? Um, now, list five things you would notice about yourself during the first hour after reaching work or when working remotely, obviously. Now, how would you notice that you had kept that going? The people you meet, how would they respond to that? And then if you really want to do a deep dive, it says list five things, but well, it's kind of like a 360, which your boss, peers, direct reports might notice about you in the first hour. So this is all about getting mindful. You know, it's a bit like people often keep their goals or what me being at my best would look like as a secret. But the more you actually get down and write them as descriptors, you're much more likely to actually behave that way. It's as if you, you're triggering your mind and your brain to actually fall into suit and the behavior will come from that. You know, it's a bit like doing a marathon. Most people would have it as a goal in their head. But the minute you say it out loud or sign up for a charity or involve others, you've just increased phenomenally the likelihood you'll actually do it, which is the same thing as these questions. Now, I would say I'd originally designed these questions with, you know, thinking with the Dirty Salad Club, you guys might use these with your own clients. But actually, more importantly, start by using it with yourself. What does you at your best look like? And actually, the more you do that, the more you start to be mindful, the more you start to notice that the amygdala, the emotional part of your brain will relax and you'll actually be able to tap into your whole cerebral cortex. You just think confident, you think change, you think all the good stuff. Now, here's an important one for us as well. There is a sprinkle of successful emotional intelligence moments. And they're often ignored because actually we look at everything on the news uh, is all about what's going wrong, how bad it is, and actually uh, you know, the contagion, et cetera, which is helpful. But we don't have to worry about that stuff because that stuff is gonna come at us anyway. We should be worried about though, identifying successful emotional intelligence moments. Well, it's all about balconying, isn't it? Everybody is talking about balconying is fun. We have, the, we have the Italians who are singing from balconies, which is amazing, inspirational. Actually, Bono from U2 got so jealous. Uh, he, or, or it inspired him, should I say, to pen a song when he saw them singing. We have the Spanish in, uh, on their balconies, and that's actually clapping and waving the frontline doctors and nurses and people in hospitals to work, which is inspirational. And if you Google these, they all come up. Now, not to be undone by the Italians, not to be undone by the Spanish. We had the Irish in Ring's End, and what did they do with their balconies? Well, look, this is the best one yet. They played bingo from the balconies. You might have seen that in the press release, which is great. Bring a sense of community coming together. So we're using humor, we're having proper coaching conversations, and we're very much identifying the EI successful moments. So one last time, guys, I'm gonna ask you to go back into a room, and this time you're going to share even the smallest emotion intelligence successful moment that you've identified. It could have been a neighbor, it could be something in the street, it could have been something you picked up that you've heard of. Well, would you please jump back into the breakout rooms? I'll fix them for you now. And I'll get your feedback in a couple of minutes. Me too. Welcome back to the clubhouse, the Dirty Salad Club. Would anybody like to share? And you please feel free to write them in the chat because as I keep saying, we're going to collate everything like a flip chart, give them back to you. But would anybody like to share now uh, via audio? Well, the one thing I want to share is that the majority of people had a uh, more like a social um, 
um, in Hansen, actually. One had uh, a family gathering through Zoom, and uh, one had this, uh, a virtual coffee shop. It was a great yeah. idea, having coffee with a neighbor across the fence. Yeah. Those kind of things that were up in our group. And uh, it, 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 it was really good to see how creative you're becoming to yeah. get close to each other. Yeah. Zoom it feels like next door almost, yeah. Love it. And also, Roy, thanks for sharing, but it's also about being deliberate, isn't it, in those relationships? Yeah. Yeah, and actually exactly. evaluate them and being careful about them and going after them. They're so, yeah. you know, everything's so fragile, really. And, every, and, a, and a pandemic like this shows you how fragile everything is. It's more important. So what's important now to us? Thanks, yeah. Roy, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else like to share one? Thank you, Roy. Anybody else? In the chat room, if you can, it'd be great. I was in, Please. Can, can you hear me okay? <clears throat> here he is. Same, I was in the same group as Roy, and he's maybe being too modest, but he said his 21-year-old son turned 21 yesterday, and instead of the big family celebration, his wife set up connection with the entire family, and everybody sang happy birthday to him, oh. which to me was just fabulous. Yeah, Love. that's great. That was great. Love. Yeah. Uh, I love us, Roy. Can I ask you? Um, did you yep. use uh, Did you use Zoom? Out of interest? Yes. Yes. Yeah? Okay. We're using Zoom now. Yeah. Yeah. I, think the I think for all of us trainers and coaches to share with each other, this seems to be the one. Uh, there's thousands of them out there, but this seems to be the one with the breakout rooms, etc. That we're all getting into. And and stable connections also. That's one thing we. Uh, that's why I asked the other gentleman, uh, Michael. He's using Teams. But we yeah. seem to have some problems with, with installing and connecting with teams. Okay. Maybe it's our problem, but we got, you know, glass fiber, internet, everything. So yeah. Zoom works good. And the other one is a Google uh, uh, Hangout. Hangout. Yeah. yeah. Those two yeah. things are very stable at the moment. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Zoom, what I like about Zoom is my tech skills are limited. And <laughs> it's idiot it proof. I, I, I've shown my mom how to use it. Uh, on the phone, so that's that's a, a good. And story. I love the breakout rooms things, even yeah. with clients when we do uh, seminars and, and training. Exactly. We can keep it going, guys. We can move everything online. So when people yeah. come to us, it's just a different way of viewing, a different way of connecting. But to Roy's point, you could even do a twenty-first celebration. So it's just <laughs> a different way of viewing it, rather than you know giving up too quickly. But anybody, before we move on to the last thing I want to cover, would anybody like to share another success? Thanks again. One more success. Oh, and, uh, using Zoom, yeah. I found out that um, the people are more open towards EI. We had some problems implementing it here in Holland because it's new here. Okay. And uh, through Zoom, when I, I do the, I do a webinar, like an introduction session on what is EI actually, yeah. and the uh, conversion is much higher than we did uh, than that we did before we organized meetings here in the office. Okay. Zoom brings you a bit more closer and people are more um, willing to listen more. And yeah, more yeah, yeah. And that's the, that's something I really surprised me because I thought it's very distance, people you know, will disconnect easily. Yeah, yeah. But on the contrary, uh, people get, are becoming more closer and they, they are, they, in their safety environment, they're, they're more easily asking questions than if they're in a group. So that's my uh, positive uh, the thing about this Zoom or, or yeah, doing. yeah, about this coaching. Okay, guys, I just want to hook us up for next week. So, the Dirty Salad Club, we're here to help coaches through the times of unpredictability, but really, it's a place for us to get together, be vulnerable, share stuff we might be with you know, uh, companies we're working with, but as practitioners, we can all share it together, looking at the best in class in terms of behavioral insights and also sharing with each other useful coaching things that are working for us in the current climate. Now, next week, it's going to be brilliant. We're going to come in just, we're keeping the time very short and snappy, 45 minutes. We have our very own uh, Billy Byrne. A lot of you will know. Some of you were just in breakout groups with him. Billy's going to cover managing and coaching remote teams with emotional intelligence, which he couldn't be more qualified to do, being an expert in the mesquite and the EQI. He's uh, also a senior associate up in the IMI, heavily involved in the EMCC. Billy is extremely passionate about coaching. It's going to be a great session next week. Again, 45 minutes. Hope you can make it along. Whatever you found useful from today, please throw it down in the chat room. Also, don't forget to do the competition and we'll get back to you. And everything that you do, what we really want to do is to keep this as a resource for all of us. So any ideas, we'll share them with you. Any recordings, any videos, anybody who's involved in this, we'll send everything on. So I just want to thank you all very much. Uh, as I end now, please feel free. 
to add anything you want into the chat that you found useful from our time together. Again, thank you very much for joining in today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Thank you.